He says you can set the whole wheel of your existence on fire by the words that you speak. So the devil is trying to inspire your speech. You can burn your marriage to the ground around you with your tongue. You can burn your health down around you with your tongue. You can destroy relationships in your family and in your life with your relatives, with the words that you speak. If we'll begin to ponder God's thoughts and his word, it becomes a stronghold for us against the enemy. And when we begin to speak God's words and speak out God's thoughts, powerful things begin to happen. Miraculous things begin to happen. Hi, I'm Bayless Conley. In life, we all face uncertainty, whether it's financial troubles, relationship valleys, a health crisis, or just trying to discover your purpose. One thing is for certain, God sees you. He loves you, and no matter what you're facing, He has the answers. Hello, and welcome to the program. We are dealing with a really, really important subject. We're answering the question, is it God, is it the devil, or is it just me? When it comes to the thoughts and the impressions that we're having, what's the source of those things? Is there a way to find out? Well, the answer is yes, there is. We can look to God's word and find out whether it's God talking to me, the devil, or whether it's just, just me coming up with this idea or with this thought. This is the second part you know, in this message, if you missed last time, hey, today will be complete in and of itself, so you will be able to get something out of this. And I just pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened as we search the Word of God together and as we talk about this important subject regarding is it God, is it the devil, or is it just me? So put on your seatbelt, put on your helmet, let's get into the Word together. I was with a family years ago. The kids were small. And I found out that where we were staying, right above and on the hillside, was a missions training center. It was a place that trained missionaries that would go out around the world. So I said, well, let's go check it out. So we go, kids in tow, and I'm trying to find the office on this campus so I can get a little tour and ask some questions. And this lady says, hi, can I help you? I said, yeah, we said, we're just, you know, wanted to see the campus, find out what it's all about. And she said, well, I can give you to her. She said, I'm one of the students here. And I think she's probably mid, maybe late thirties. I said, okay. I, I began to ask her questions. Turns out her husband is also in the school. They're planning to go into missions work and to spend their life on the mission field, spend the rest of their life on the mission field. And so as we're going, I found out how she got saved and she had been a high-powered secretary for, I believe, the president of a Fortune 500 company. She made a huge salary, was really well off. Her husband was a scientist that, I believe, worked for a major firm, made a great salary. They, they had very easy lives, very comfortable lives, set for their future, but they got saved. And they felt God was calling them to the mission field. And in particular, God had put on their heart an indigenous group that lived on a little remote South Sea Island that were living below the poverty line. And so they're training to go there and spend their lives. They're going to share Christ with those people. And her husband, being a scientist, he's trying to figure out ways to create an industry for them using coconuts because that was virtually the only thing that would grow on that island. Turns out they're living in someone's garage they bathe outside with a garden hose every day while they're preparing. They've given up everything. And I, I said to her, you guys believe in radical sacrifice, don't you? And without skipping a beat, she said, no, we believe in radical obedience. That is part of the Christian life, my friend. But the devil will always want to turn us away from that pathway of obedience to God. And don't get me wrong, I know that God gives us richly all things to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6, 17. I'm not talking about a life that has all of the joy and all of the goodness siphoned out of it, nor am I even talking about a life that is void of good things. However, each of us, as we walk with God and enjoy his bounty, God will call us to, upon us to make sacrifices for the sake of his kingdom to deny ourselves, to take up our cross. 
And friend, the Lord also calls us to take a stand for the truth And to take a stand for the name of Christ, knowing that that may draw persecution, it may draw misunderstanding, it may draw hardship. And the devil would say, no, listen, you you can just, you can live a comfortable life. You know, just just be a a high maintenance, low impact Christian. Don't think about sacrifice. Don't think about the loss. Don't think about eternity. Just stay in your bubble here. It's good. It's comfortable. No danger to anyone else. No danger to you. No, my friend, God has called us to be dangerous. We need to realize that this life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And one day we will stand before our maker and give an account for our stewardship of everything that he's given us, the influence, the resources, the giftings. And we need to live for Christ while we can. I'm telling you, you listen to me. Eternity is waiting for every one of us. Eternity is waiting for you. And yes, I believe God blesses us in this life. I live a blessed life. I'm a blessed man. I'm blessed in relationships. I'm blessed on so many levels. But I also realize I'm a pilgrim passing through this life. And we need to keep the blesser first and his will first in our lives. But when the devil talks to us, it's about our comfort. It's about what's best for us. It's not like, hey, you know, don't, don't, don't step out in faith. Don't think about doing something for the kingdom. Don't do anything radical. radical. Come back. Just, just l- listen. Here, have another lemonade. I'll rock your hammock a little longer. We're good. Let's be friends. Broadening the spectrum just a bit. How else can you discern if a thought's come from the devil? Well, obviously, it's going to be contrary to Scripture. The devil always sows seeds of doubt concerning God's declaration and God's promises. He always wants to cast a shadow over what God says. In the garden, after God had given his instructions to Adam about the trees of the garden, the devil shows up. The first thing he says, first thing he says to a human being, he says to Eve, has God said? First thing he does is he challenges God's word. I think it's verse 17. He's just been baptized in the Jordan River by John. The heavens open and a voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The very, very next thing that happens, Jesus is in the wilderness tempted by the devil. And the first thing that the devil says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, Now, God had just made the declaration, this is my beloved son. First thing the devil challenges is what God said, if you're God's son. You know, all those stories your mama told you about being visited by an angel and you being conceived by the Holy Spirit never really happened. It was just the misguided love of a mother trying to make you feel special. The devil always, always will challenge the promise of God and try and get you to doubt God's word. Tell you that it's not relevant for today. That God's principles, God's laws about how you handle your finances, about your sexuality, how you you treat your wife, how you treat your neighbor, about forgiving, all those things are not relevant. They're not current. You can't apply them in today's society. Come on. Friend, that's the devil talking those thoughts come from the enemy now we could go on and on with that but i want to share something with you that i think is is powerful think about this god influenced peter and peter spoke the devil influenced peter and peter spoke god influenced peter 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 spoke the devil influences peter Peter spoke. Both our heavenly father and the devil, they're after our tongues. Because the words we speak carry power. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who indulge in it 
will eat the fruit of it for death or for life. Consider these verses. James chapter 3, verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go ever, wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. So it likens our tongue and the words we speak to a bit in a horse's mouth, to a rudder on a ship. You know, some of you that maybe knew my mama when she was still on planet Earth and got to know her, you may have found out that she was quite a horsewoman. She was raised on a cattle ranch in Florida. She was put on a horse's back before she could walk. And numerous times, I watched my mama outride the best cowboys you could ever imagine. Most of the time, she liked to ride bareback. She was a wonder on a horse. Consequently, she put my sister and I on horses when we were young, and we'd go out and ride at different places, and we'd go early in the morning when the horses were fresh before they'd been ridden. And I remember we were at these stables one time. There's a couple of cowboys there. And one of them looks at me, he says, kid, you know how to ride? I said, I can ride. He snickered, looked at his friend. The other cowboy says, let's put him on king. And the other guy's eyes got really big. I said, really? He said, yeah, put him on king. And the guy just laughed at me. They brought out this huge bay-colored horse. And uh, I got up on king, my little 75-pound frame on a 1,200-pound horse. And within 30 seconds, King tried to rub me off on a fence. And then he bolted, and there were these low-hanging branches on a tree, and he tried to knock me off of the branches, and I'm riding down low in the saddle. And he began to buck. But within about 10 minutes, King and I had an understanding. King realized that I was boss. And in 10 minutes, I could make that horse back up, gallop, turn left, turn right, do anything that I wanted to do. Little 75-pound boy holding on to the reins. Got that bit in that horse's mouth. Says, if we can control our tongue, we can control our life. And then he says, like a rudder on a ship. I was standing on Seal Beach Pier when the Queen Mary sailed into Long Beach Harbor in 1967. I don't know if you've ever been on that boat. It is enormous, massive. But you can go up into the pilot house and there's a wheel there that the skipper he could turn that wheel with one finger, it turns the rudder, and there could be a, a storm going on, and he can make that ship go where it wants. James said, with our tongue, our life, the, the, the direction of our life, just like that horse, like that ship, it's determined by the words that we speak. Listen to what he says next, profound, verse five. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. When it says the tongue is a fire, that fire is speaking of inspiration. The devil is after our tongue. And it says you can set your whole life on fire. In the Greek language, it literally says the whole wheel of your existence. In other words, every aspect of your life, you've got this wheel. One spoke is your marriage. Another spoke is your finances. Another spoke your relationship with your kids. Another spoke your health. Another spoke your mental well-being. Another spoke your career. And on and on and on. Literally. He says you can set the whole wheel of your existence on fire by the words that you speak so the devil is trying to inspire your speech. You can burn your marriage to the ground around you with your tongue. You can burn your health down around you with your tongue. You can destroy relationships in your family and in your life with your relatives with the words that you speak. Now consider this. You all know Ephesians 6. It talks about the spiritual battle we're in. That we don't want to be ignorant, you know, of the devil's devices. But we need to stand against the wiles, against the strategies of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, etc. Against the evil, you know, rulers of this world. 
against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit realm. And then it comes down and says, and take the shield of faith. All right, take the shield of faith wherewith you will be able to quench all the, what kind of darts? The fiery darts. One translation says the flaming missiles. Another says flaming arrows. You can quench all the fiery darts. In other words, you answer with faith in God's word like Jesus did in the wilderness. He said, it is written. When the devil shoots his fiery darts, you respond with faith in God's word and it quenches them. But friend, mark it as true. When the devil shoots that fiery arrow at you, his target is your mind. Thoughts. And if he succeeds, like he did with Judas in getting one of those thoughts to lodge and you begin to ponder it and you begin to think on it, you accept it. What happens is it drops from here down to your tongue. And when you begin to speak it out, the devil doesn't need to do anything else. You can set the whole wheel of your existence on fire and cause damage to it if your tongue gets inspired by hell. Think about this, talking about the warfare we're involved in, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity to obedience, of, to the obedience of Christ, taking every thought captive. Now he shares a progression from the end to the beginning. First thought comes and he says, take every thought captive. Some of the thoughts, the things that, that you're thinking, the things that are dragging you down, you need to capture that thought and turn it over and look at it. So where did that come from? Who told me this? You know, it's the first thing God asked Adam in the garden. Who told you? Who told you the things you're believing? Who told you the things you're saying? Who told you the things that you've embraced as truth? Look it over. Does it exalt itself against the knowledge of God? Is it contrary to scripture? Or is it in line with God's word? Because if you don't capture that thought, it grows into an argument. That's the next thing in the progression. It begins to make sense in your mind. You've got this argument that you're now coming into agreement with, even though it may be against scripture. And it could be about anything, but it becomes an argument. And friend, arguments are harder to, to, to cast down than, than thoughts are to capture. And then if you don't deal with it in the argument stage, it grows into a stronghold. The devil gets a stronghold in your mind. A stronghold is harder to pull down than an argument, which is harder to cast down than it is to capture thought. A stronghold is a position from which the enemy can work. And he's after your tongue. He's after my tongue. You know, I had a friend, his name was John. And I suppose all of us were kind of firebugs. We all used to play with matches when we were little boys. But John was the worst of us. And we had a little fort in his backyard that we built. It adjoined the house around the side of the house. And John was out in the fort one day playing with matches and he caught the fort on fire. Tried to put it out, but flames were licking up the side of the fort. And then all of a sudden it's against the house and flames are going up the side of the house and smoke is ascending in the neighborhood. People can see it. His mama comes out, sees that the fort is ablaze and it's, it's licking up the side of the house. She gets the garden hose, manages to put it out. And so I came over to play with John a couple days later, rode my bike over and said, can I play with John? She said, no, John can't come out today. I said, really? She said, yeah, come on, Bayless, I'll show you. There's a huge chalkboard in the living room. He has to write 1,000 times, I will not play with matches. 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 A friend, the devil shoots that flaming arrow. And if we don't capture the thought, 
grows into an argument. If we don't cast down the argument, it grows into a stronghold. And then we begin to speak it. And what happens is that match hits the comb or hits the striker strip and you got a fire. You can speak it. You got a fire in your marriage. You got some major problems going on. Relationships are on fire. Might deal with your health, might deal with whatever. And all of a sudden, you've gone from being a Christ lover and a lover of the body of Christ to being cynical. You don't have a good thing to say about God's family. You don't have a good thing to say about what Jesus is doing in the world. That's all the devil wants. But you know what? The other side of that coin is also true. If we'll begin to ponder God's thoughts and his word, it becomes a stronghold for us against the enemy. And when we begin to speak God's words and speak out God's thoughts, powerful things begin to happen. Miraculous things begin to happen. I mean, consider, and I've shared this so many times, Romans 10, 9, and 10. So someone shares the gospel with you. You hear that Jesus is the son of God. That God sent him and he willingly came to this world, became one of us, lived a sinless life. And was taken by jealous hands, beaten, put through a mock trial, crucified. And there on the cross, God laid the penalty for the sin of the world on his own son. And he died as a substitute for the world. And God canceled our debt. Third day, Jesus is raised from the dead. So you hear the gospel. Thought. Begin to think about it. The Holy Spirit begins to work. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I believe that. In Romans 10, 9, 10, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. You confess him with your mouth as Lord. You'll be saved. You begin to speak those words and they're so powerful. It suddenly changes you and makes you into a new creation in Christ. It takes the sin nature out of your spirit and puts the nature of Christ within you. It makes you fit for heaven. That, that confession coupled with your heart changes your eternal destiny from hell to heaven. How powerful is that? Now, if your words can ignite something that powerful, is it hard for us to understand how they can do less things like dispelling depression? getting a marriage that's in trouble back on track, creating an atmosphere of peace in the home, opening a door of favor that would otherwise remain closed. No, my friend, thoughts are powerful things. And yeah, most of what goes on in our head is just us. And I don't, don't overdo it. But there are most definitely some thoughts, destructive thoughts, divisive thoughts, crippling thoughts that come from the enemy. And what he's after is our tongue. But God the Father also inspires. Your tongue's looking for inspiration. My tongue's looking for inspiration. And when we've accepted God's thoughts, God's ideas, God's word, and we begin to speak those things, oh, things begin to change. It is a powerful thing when the heart and the tongue come together. What we fill our mind with will drop down into our heart. And friend, the tongue takes inspiration from that and power is released, whether for good or for evil. I mean, think about this, Romans 10, 9 and 10. For with the heart, a man, a person believes and with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. If I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and I confess him with my mouth as Lord, I will be saved. It results in me being changed inwardly in such a radical fashion. Jesus called it being born. Again, I'm literally brought into a relationship with the God who created me when I put my heart and my lips together. Is it hard to understand how lesser things can be accomplished, how lesser things can happen when we put heart and lips together? My friend, let us take our inspiration from God's word. Let us fill our mind, 
fill our heart with the Word of God and then begin to speak in line with God's Word. It'll bring forth good things. Jesus said, out of the good treasure of a good man's heart, good things come to pass. Good things are brought forth. And I want to just thank you for, for joining me today. And if I could come into your home, if I could come into your kitchen, I, I'd love to sit down, have a cup of tea with you, discuss the word, have a time of prayer. But this is sort of the next best thing. So I just listen. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for being a part of this. Just keep watching. Keep being a part of it. We're going to be bringing some great things your way. And if you have never confessed the Lordship of Jesus in your life, do it today. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Confess him with your mouth as your Lord. And friends, salvation will come your way. One person catches the vision. Others join in. The objective is huge. As others are included using their gifts and influence, good progress can be made together. In the church, there is only steady and lasting progress as each generation builds up, supports, and encourages the next. In his book, From Generation to Generation, Bayless Conley outlines the role, responsibility, and opportunity each generation has to connect and build God's church together. Glean from Bayless's experience and practical advice. Use the information on the screen now to order your copy of From Generation to Generation.